Welcome to West Virginia Beer Roads, a podcast all about beer from a West Virginia perspective. I'm your host, Charles Bockway. Today we travel to the fantastic Weathered Ground Brewery in Cool Ridge, West Virginia, where we meet up with Sam Fonda, the co-owner and head of brewery operations there. One thing we've learned about Weathered Ground Brewery is when you combine their beautiful tap room, the natural scenery it sits in, and the beer quality and variety, you couldn't find a better place to hang out anywhere in the Appalachian region. So today we're visiting with Sam Fonda, and he's put out some beers for us, and we'll move right to that podcast. So I asked Sam Fonda to set out four beers that are his freshest ones on tap, pretty much. And here we are at the 1st of September. Sam, thanks for picking out some beers that I really like. Absolutely. All four of these beers are, well, two of them, the general public hasn't even had yet as far as these batches. And the other two are also extremely fresh. We only had them for about a week. Let me start with the first beer that... um, which I think we probably should start with in this panel of four, and that's your Kolsch. And this Kolsch beer you call Eine Kleine Nachtmusik? Beer music. Oh, I'm sorry. I was back in uh, Mozart here, but that's where that came from. Sure. (laughs) Yeah, say that again. Eine Kleine Beer Music. Yep. I love it. Uh, So when you hear that name, I think what you're trying to do is really make a traditional uh, Kolsch from uh, the Cologne area of Germany. Well, with an Appalachian twist, of course, uh, all the grain uh, from this comes from, it's regionally grown and malted, but we use traditional Kolsch yeast for fermentation as well as German-grown hops. We try to replicate what you might drink if you're in Cologne. Yeah. Kolsch is typically one of Germany's lightest styles of beer. Um, You know, it's a lower ABV beer. There, you know, typically never over 5%, roughly. Uh, what's the, How does yours stack up in that ABV range? Ours is just under 5%, uh, yeah. 4.8. Yeah, so that's pretty much right in the center of where a lot of the German ones are that you taste over there. And, and I think one, one of the problems I've always had with Kolsch in America, and I've been drinking them, you know, off and on when you can find them, and they're not one you used to find very often at small breweries, but when I did find it, I'd try it. And a lot of times in the early days, you know, maybe back in the late 90s or the 2000s, uh, first decade of this century, they were just kind of like blonde ales or something. I don't think the people really knew what they were doing or they weren't really making a traditional style Kolsch. But in more recent years, the bar has been raised. And this beer that you do raises the bar a lot uh, in our Kolsch's in West Virginia. And we now have, you know, a bunch of breweries in West Virginia making Kolsch. So, Talk a little bit about why you're liking what you're doing with this Kolsch. Well, for us, we talk about four ingredients of beer, water, malt, hops, and yeast. Mm. But there's two other ingredients, really, that kind of get left out, and that's time and temperature. (laughs) Time and temperature uh, play a large part. Uh, There's no shortcuts here. We take our time. We let it do its job during fermentation, and then we lager it and uh, let it age cold. Yeah, and I think for uh, our listeners that are not home brewers, because a lot of home brewers probably made a Kolsch before or tried, when you mention time and temperature, it's quite different from your typical ale, and certainly a regular blonde ale. And talk about how those uh, those two factors vary. How's the temperature when you make it vary, and, and then the, the time as well? Sure. When you're brewing Kolsch, one of the most important factors is temperature of fermentation because of, yeah. if you're brewing a traditional style Kolsch, uh, that requires a specific type of yeast that, that is an ale yeast but ferments at much lower temperatures, a lot like a lager. And uh, instead of fermenting the beer at room temperature for a short amount of time, we we ferment the Kolsch at a lower temperature around 50 degrees for a much longer time. A lot of times it takes over two weeks for it, sometimes two weeks for it to complete fermentation. So a lot of times if we brew an ale at the brewery, it, it ferments, you know, sometimes it's done fermenting in like three or four days, five days. 
But when we brew this specific type of ale, the Kolsch, a lot of times it takes almost two weeks just for it to ferment. And that's because the yeast uh, takes longer at those lower temps to get the job done. But then we're going to age it cold for another three to four weeks and make sure that it really gets crisp and smooth as well as uh, we don't have a filter here at the brewery. A lot of bigger breweries have like a large uh, filter you'd see in the wine industry and and sure. uh, a bunch of plates of filtering. Yeah, We do not have a filter. It takes a lot longer for our yeast to drop out. It's still not completely clear uh right. another couple weeks and it probably will be yeah but, course, that's uh, the the lagering time and you said it you know here it could be three or four weeks during that time is when a lager regular lager or certainly the colch tends to clear up because those yeast particles and other solids drop to the bottom and you pull off the clear beer from the top and yeah so this beer i think you know i call it basically clear right i hear you it might not be 100 percent bright it will get it will get um, more clear, um, but it's uh, it tastes perfectly fine to me. So we were ready to go ahead and, and package. Yeah. So the hops you use in this beer is it more traditionally hopped in the sense of using German hops like the Hollertowers and Tetnangs and absolutely. Yep. So we uh, for bittering hops we use German Magnum hops and mm -hmm. then. Uh, for a little bit of flavor and aroma, we just delicately hop it with Tetanang hops. You know, I know even when I've been in uh, Cologne a few times in Germany uh, and going around to the old, go to the old town, part of the section of the town or the city, and that's where a lot of the Kolsch, uh, the Kolsch outlets are and their tap rooms. And you can just go, you know, down the block and hit another one. And so you kind of get to compare them. And I've always found that the ones I like, and maybe that's just my personal taste and certainly doesn't mean it's better or not better, but um, I like the ones that had a little more bitterness so that they're not too bland without bitterness. And I, I just felt that they stood up better to me. Uh, and how, do, how do you approach the bitterness side of, of a Kolsch? Uh, I'm just a big fan of, of being balanced. If you, don't, mm -hmm. if you don't have some bitterness in there and some bite, uh, th then the beer is going to be way too sweet. And so uh, I try to balance, we try to balance everything downstairs and, the first time we made this beer, honestly, it needed some work, and so I think we've we've honed in, and it continues to get better. Mm -hmm. We're always tweaking, and I really think that Anthony's done a good job at, uh, at dialing this beer in, and it's a good batch of Kolsch. We don't brew it constantly. We just brew it a couple times a year, but uh, it's tasting good. Yeah, it, it is tasting good, and I like that. Uh, tiny bit of fruitiness that's coming through, um, which is more of the ale character, but then it's also very much light in that, in the malts and light in the overall impact of the grains and even the hops, sort of like a, a base lager, you know, so it does come, it's kind of, you can see why they call it a hybrid type beer because it's a not nearly as much of the grains and, uh, grains and fruitiness of, of, of your ales, you know, like a blonde ale, a straight blonde ale would be. Sure. And it's that, got a yeah. little more complexity than a Pilsner. Yeah, there's more going on because of that. Yeah, because it still has some of those ale characteristics with the lager characteristics. That, nice job on this. How does this sell in West Virginia? How well? Um, not, as, uh, not as well as our... German style Pilsners and our, um, it's, you know, the name of the beer is not very easy to pronounce in, on a bar menu. Oh. It sells, uh, we're trying to promote accounts, maybe to call it Weatherground Kolsch to their customers. Um, it's hard to say, Anna Kleine Beer Music. Uh, oh, that's and, true. But, uh, you know, it's gaining traction. I'll put it that way. Gotcha. Well, then I know we have another lighter style, at least alcohol, lighter style beer. We're going to move to another country, uh, not too awfully far from the home area of a Kolsch, which you know, is northern Germany. Well, you go right over into Belgium next door, sort of. You'll get to the French speaking area of um, Belgium, which is always kind of weird to me that, you know, half the country speaks one language and another half speaks another language. And then through the last probably hundred years, uh, they, they've been making a nice beer, which uh, you call 
Little grazer is what we call our grisette. Little grazer grisette, yes. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, first, uh, I call it a little lighter style beer. What's the ABV on it? 4.2% uh, is where this one comes in. Yeah, and it's, I think it fits into the farmhouse ale category of, of uh, Belgian beers, which you, know, you don't see a ton of those around in American brewers. They don't make a ton of them, nor do we see them on tap a lot of places. Certainly not this style. In your mind, what does characterize a grisette to you, and why do you make it? You know, tasting this, you, you wouldn't find a lot of difference between this and a typical uh, Cezanne. Um, it is it's sort of a subset of a Cezanne. Um, Certainly the, a lower ABV than a normal Cezanne. It's lower ABV. You know, historically in Belgium, grisettes were made in a specific area and were lower ABV. Everything that from my research uh, has told me that, you know, in Belgium, they make Cezannes for farm workers and they've made grisettes for local miners. Yeah. And grisettes seem to be a little bit hazier because of uh, the incorporation of wheat or sometimes oats or corn. Yeah. Uh, different, yeah. different types of grain besides just barley. And so uh, we specifically use wheat and a lot of it. Right. And I think even in, in Belgium today, you, you find a few farmhouse ales, uh, the Saisons, that'll have a little bit of wheat, a small portion. But these uh, grisettes have a large portion of wheat. What's the portion of wheat in your grain bill here? I think it's uh, over 60 percent. Uh, so that's, is, in, that's pretty in the high range, I think, for uh, wheat in any beer. Yeah. Absolutely. We use a lot of malted wheat as well as... Uh, as flaked wheat. Yeah, and I, I thought I think in in, uh, in Belgium they tend to use malted wheat more in the, in these kinds of beers. Uh, maybe that's just because of the local traditions, but whatever. And I love it that this grisette in West Virginia, yeah, maybe you can market it to the miners or our coal miners, you know, like they used to in Belgium. Uh, but but even if you don't, I think it's a great one for anybody to drink, especially if you're looking for a bit of a lighter style, the four and a half percent range of, of beer. Uh, you don't see a lot of those in our in our small breweries today. So what's been your experience after making this with the way it sells? Do people say, oh, it's a lower ABV beer. I don't want it. It's a niche beer. <laughs> uh, Belgian beer lovers and craft brewers that want to have some fun and taste it. We sell a lot of this kind of beer the way that we're having it today on a flight board. Um, you know, it's not as popular as your IPAs and your fruited sours, but, yeah. uh, you know, uh, we're hanging in there. We're trying to, we're not, we're not throwing these kind of beers out the window. We're, we're still making them. And we have a, uh, we have a niche group of, of beer drinkers that I think appreciate the fact that we're, uh, still producing these kind of beers. Yeah. And I think even in Belgium, they, it's quite a variation in, in whether it be saisons or grisettes. Each brewery has their own sort of grain bills, and they, they don't try to just make them exactly alike. Uh, tops vary. There's no like one thing. It's just like not, you know. It, it, so could you explain a little bit about the way you hop this? We talked a little bit about the grain bill, but how do you use the hops? I mean, I think Anthony and I's philosophy is to uh, – let the yeast shine. Uh, that's real. You don't really want to get in the way of the yeast characteristics in a saison. That's uh, that's the star of the show there. And so we don't use very much hops at all in this beer. Yeah, it's ba it's barely hops, maybe with some tetanine, and uh, and that's about it. Yeah, I think that's probably a, a good summary of Belgian style ales. Is that it's a yeast driven beer more than a hop driven beer yeah we don't want to muddy it up too much we want to let the uh i agree with that we want to let the the yeast shine here as well as the grain i mean the hops are, are kind of our least concern it's, it's got some hops in there like i said earlier we don't want to we want to have a little bit of bitterness um but uh we like to let the yeast shine yeah also it's big on the fruitiness and that's again a lot yeast driven in this case kind of fruity and spicy maybe uh, 
So would you say that is primarily from the, the yeast you use? hundred percent. And and talk a little bit about the those kinds of yeast. I mean, I know there's many varieties of yeast in Belgium, but do you use a more traditional Belgium uh, farmhouse yeast? We use a blend of uh, Belgian and French. Mm -hmm. Specifically for this beer, we play around with other Belgian Saison yeast strains, but the specific mm -hmm. beer that you're tasting, and that, that's the one that I prefer, uh, is a blend of Belgian and French yeah, and Saison and yeast. Just the aromas even coming out of this are kind of like a spicy pear or something. I don't know. What do you what do you get out of this beer? I agree with I agree with you. It the, and that can change uh, depending on what temperature you ferment the the beer at, but uh, this is fermented on the higher not I mean not as high as it can go, but in that seventy seven to eighty degree range. But like thinking back to the Kolsch we just tried, again, that one is fermented at a cooler temperature, probably, I don't know, is it 50, 60 degrees or something? But this one's going to be a good bit higher than that. So that really affects, and especially also uses a totally different yeast. So those two differences, the yeast difference and the temperature differences, give this one so much different flavor and more power up front. I mean, it's got a lot of... We find that the flavor. general audience um, mm. likes the fruitiness a little bit more than the really spicy clove uh, mm -hmm. type of flavors that the yeast can put out. So we we try to lean more towards uh, some fruitiness in the fermentation. Well, you certainly got it in this one today. Maybe a little bit of bubble gum in there. <laughs> it could be, but those are all, uh, that's good to know that those are all more yeast driven flavors in a grisette, you know, and, and again, in the coals, they weren't trying to get any uh, yeast flavors particularly. You know, they're just making a light, very, try to make a clean beer as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And in both those beers, you've succeeded. I, I think in, you look at the style guidelines, that you might read in a you know in a online, you're going to find that uh, these two beers they hit the marks on those style guidelines. So let's talk a minute about uh, any foods that you could pair with these beers. Is there anything that that you think like um, maybe Grisette uh, would pair well with? Grisette specifically, I would pair that with a charcuterie board. Oh yeah. Um. As I would most uh, Belgian style beers, I mean cheese, cheese crackers, uh, assorted meats. Um, it can be really fun to, uh, as well as, as fruits like strawberries and things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, I would I would pair a grisette with that. It just seems to to go well with really funky cheese and as mm -hmm. well as some you know citrusy fruits. Yeah, and I, I think. Even that fruitiness would go well with some of your like barbecued chickens. I mean, not really hot, spicy ones, but sure. ones that are more mild. Uh, but given, uh, I don't know, just a, that blend and a kind of a counter even to maybe a smoked meat. This because it's so different, it would be a real counter to a maybe a you know smoked meats or sausages. I could see that happening too. Absolutely. Yeah, it's pretty versatile. Um, where the Kolsch. Uh, do you have any feelings on what you'd recommend people try that with? You know, in my, in my opinion might be different than other people's, but a really good cheeseburger, anything, <laughs> anything that you need to wash it down, you know, yes. uh, it's such a light beer. So if you're eating anything heavy, like a cheeseburger or I don't know, a rack of ribs or anything like uh, uh, really heavy food that you want a good light beer to wash it down with. I recommend the Kolsch. Right. If you're trying to really bring out the flavors of, of the beer, you know, uh, maybe maybe more citrus fruit and uh, or uh, it goes great with a salad. Yeah, know? a green salad uh, mm -hmm. would be nice with that. I also know that in, um, in Germany, in Cologne, that uh, at the Kolsch outlets, that are restaurants, uh, they sell a lot of uh, like bratwurst, sure. you know, a lighter style sausage sure. uh, with with their kolsch. And uh, also chicken salads or chicken, you know, it's something that you'll see with kolsch. And I think any of that kind of stuff works. And I especially like the idea of having a green salad with kolsch and even one with a creamy dressing, you know, that you can, can get that fat that gets washed down with the, 
with the effervescence in the Kolsch. Even though the Kolsch is not a highly effervescent beer, and then the grisettes traditionally are uh, one that would have more carbonation. Is that what you do here as well? We try. We try to carbonate. We try to achieve as much carbonation um, as we can, but st still low enough to where we can package it. Right. In because it's not going to be like traditionally in Bel a lot of Belgian beers are bottle conditioned. Right. We can this beer, and so uh, we have. It has to be low enough carbonation to where we can still package it. We found out the hard way uh, that. Uh, that you have to have enough, it has to be yeah. low enough to be able to can it. Yeah, I guess you're right. And, and I don't have a lot of experience drinking grisettes in Belgium to, to know exactly how they're served or the most popular packaging or anything. Certainly in Germany, when you're drinking Kolsch at the breweries, it's all on draft. And, and they don't, I'm sure they bottle some, and certainly we get it over here bottled, but imported, but the, that style tends to be very, drunk very fresh mm -hmm. mostly at the local market just at their brewery tap rooms yeah but and we, that's what you can get here at the weather ground get these things fresh absolutely with the uh the grisette we do try to we try to carbonate it at a high level yeah yeah and that that would be more traditional certainly the saisons and, and this whole farmhouse ale arena they're they're going to have a lot higher carbonation and have a richer thicker head than you want, you'd ever find on a colch you want them to be zippy yeah. As I say. Well, so we're going to move on here. Uh, it's becoming fall time. I mean, at least we wouldn't know it from the weather. You know, it's been very warm here, which is great for drinking these grisettes and colch. And, but looking ahead, and, you know, September is when all the Oktoberfest beers, uh, that style of lager from Germany originally, and now certainly in America, it's become a mainstay of September, October. So let's talk about your entry into that market sure every year uh we brew what we call aj's fest beer and it is our spin on the Mertzen style of beer so it's it's a deep amber lager we love it uh it's there's nothing fancy about it uh it's straight to the point october oktoberfest style Mertzen. Yeah, tasting great this year. It's really a malt-driven beer. It really is. Your blend of malts, and I, I want you to talk about those because, folks, this beer really shows off the malts, and I want to know what malts he puts in these and where he gets them because it's it's really nice. We source all almost all the malt from this beer in this beer from uh, Riverbend Malt House. Their Munich-style malts, as well as their Pilsner malts. It's mostly that, and we, we use a little bit of caramel malts uh, from Germany as well. And then does that give you a little more color then? It gives you a little more color, and that's about it. Keep it simple, you know. But it's a beautiful color, you know, kind of very, you know, a slightly orange or reddish tint to a, a tan. I mean, it's a, how, how do you describe this color? While it was in the tank, <laughs> I was extremely worried that it was too dark this year. And then as soon as, uh, as, soon as it came time to package... It was a uh, beautifully uh, bright, light, light amber color. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it, to me, it's as clean as they get. Uh, we, uh, it is a lager. We ferment it, we ferment it cool. It takes a couple weeks to ferment and then we age it cold as long as we can. We joke about the way that we release it every year. Some in the past, sometimes we've had like a release date and, uh, things like that. Um, this year, it just we were just really liking the way it was tasting, and we just decided to tap it. Um, and it's available in cans right now as well. To me, uh, Oktoberfest, Martin, Martin, it always reminds me of football season. And so it just reminds me of having friends at the house during the cooler weather watching right. the football games. Yeah, you get a good crisp fall day here in West Virginia. Certainly up here in Cool Ridge, we're in the high country up on a plateau and uh, get a nice cool day here at the tap room and this beer, it's, wow. The, it's, it's interesting. It's a German style beer and, you know, in Germany it reminds people of other things. But to me, in America, it reminds me of watching football games with my friends. Well, so, you, you can do a lot worse than having this beer, uh, at a, you know, for your football game watching. Sure. It, you know, we're calling it a, a Märzen style, which is a you know a German style lager. 
It's got a lot of color, as we said, a lot of nice amber rich colors. And a lot of people call this, because of English, Marzen. You hear the bars talking about Marzen beer. Well, it's the same thing. And it's, a, it's like a, the style that a lot of the Germans traditionally, over a lot, hundred years or so, have been making as what they call Oktoberfest beers. But, you know, these days, uh, most of the beer they make for Oktoberfest in Germany in the last couple, 20, 30 years has been a lighter style. They just call it Fest beer, and it's a blonder beer. Still a little bit high on the ABV, but, uh, but, it's, but it's a blonde beer. But, hey, in West Virginia, I think we like these traditional old-style old German Märzen styles for Oktoberfest. Sure. Most of our breweries make, make that. Some also make the lighter style, Fest beer. Have you guys made both before? We have not. We're. I'm interested in it. This would be the second year in a row. The time has come and gone, sort of. Um, but uh, maybe next year. Uh, we. Uh, I love the. I love those style of beers too. It's just we. We put such an emphasis on this one, and it takes up so much time and tank space that we just have not. We have not gone towards the lighter one yet. Sam, I think this beer should be a commercial for whoever you get most of these malts from. Uh, they're really showing through, and they're well done. These are nice beers, and even if they're not from a German malt house, if they're from a local American malt house, these are good malts. Freshness, I mean, freshness is so much about it. We get, we get the. It doesn't get any fresher. It comes straight from North Carolina. You can, you can smell the difference when you open up the back of the truck that it, uh, when it gets unloaded. It makes a difference to me. You, like you say, you can smell it when it, it it's in the grain room, or you can smell it when it comes off the truck. Absolutely. Yeah, it's beautiful. Anyway, it's good to hear that you're committed to using more of our eastern uh, malts than than just buying whatever's cheapest out on the market. And I think, folks, that's why you know you go to a small craft brewer because they care about the quality of everything, and it's not just what can we make to sell it and make the most profit? Yeah. And it's about supporting your neighbors and it trickles, it trickles down to everybody and relationships and stuff like that. And, and we like using local or at least regionally grown and malted products. And we, uh, we love Riverbend Malt House as well as Carolina Malt House as well. And that's where we get primarily most of our malt from. Yeah. Yeah, I know you're probably among West Virginia brewers, the one that uses a higher percentage of these local small boutique malt company products than anyone else. So I appreciate that. And I thank you for um, supporting our local regional malt houses. Let's move on to the final beer that we have on our board today. And this is one that certainly I've had before in a style that I grew up sort of drinking in I, craft. I am slightly worried because because we've had such a good conversation <laughs> and it's been, you know, 20 minutes since I poured the flight that this has warmed up a bit. Um, okay. Well, let's introduce this one. It's, this is That Old West Coast IPA. And when you say That Old West Coast, how would you come up with that name? Um, well, it's just... Reminded me of a throwback, um, you know, that old, like, uh, let's brew that old West Coast. Uh, it's just meant to be um, a retro, not retro, but a, a throwback to IPAs that got us into liking IPAs. And it's totally different than the IPAs that are make up vast majority of the market today, the hazy, hazy, juicy, uh, new, mm -hmm. new England style IPAs. Uh, this is supposed to be bright and bitter and also have a lot of citra aromatics and, um, it's supposed to be slightly dry and just brewed in a very traditional American IPA way. Yeah. Let's talk about, you know, some of those primary differences. Number one, it's a, the, between this and the East Coast style or the New England style, this is a uh, much more clear. Should be bright and clear. Mm -hmm. uh, where you know it's not a hazy beer. Mm -hmm. Still an IPA. It harkens back probably to the original English styles, but then when it came to America out in the West Coast, they raised their own kind of hops that became popular out there, and this was hopped with those 
not English hops. Yeah. So talk a little bit about the hops you use and emphasize again in this beer. So we have some hops that put out what we believe are kind of a piney flavor. Um, right. So almost spruce-like. And then you've also got centennial hops that push out more like uh, fruity, fruitiness, like berry type flavors. And then to top it off, you know, Amarillo, which Amarillo is the majority of it, or not the majority, but the kind of what we use the most of in it. Um, uh, we like to use the word dank. Yes. Um, and uh, a lot of people associate that with Simcoe, but I think when you open up that bag of fresh Amarillo, it's very dank. Um, it's almost like pine to the extreme. But, um, it's a uh, very delicious hop. It also puts out some fruitiness as well. And then we also have to throw in some citra hops. But we want to make it different enough from our Tallahatchie IPA, which focuses on citra hops, um, which is kind of a similar beer. So we use predominantly Amarillo in the uh, dry hop. Yeah. So that's true, where the uh, West Coast styles typically are heavy on the dry hopping, uh, but they, again, are with certain hop varieties that give you that, whether it be piney, dank, yeah, upfront flavors, rather than the East Coast, where they focus more on hops, again, late hop, dry hop, that focus more on fruity and flavors. This also is dry hop with a lot of Cascade hops as well. And Cascade hops certainly are one of the original American hops that became very popular. And Sierra Nevada Brewery uh, out of California made them very popular uh, with their pale ale. And that, so if you know that uh, Sierra Nevada pale ale flavor, you know uh, Cascade hop flavor. They make fun of me so much for saying uh, best batch yet while we're canning, <laughs> when we're tasting things. You know, out of the tank, they they say best batch yet because they're waiting on me to say that. Yeah, all four of these, I would say, best batch yet. Well, I love these uh, four beers because they are so different and unique. And anyone who thinks beer is beer, you know, hasn't really come to weather ground and and, and had a flight of these four because uh, they are so unique to and each individual beer. And so flavorful. And they give you that range of flavors that the craft beer industry thrives on. It's why we love craft beer and why we love our West Virginia breweries. We've always loved to have flavorful variety. So what do you see in West Virginia these days? I mean, you, you make a lot of different styles here, weather ground. And do you see any trends moving through or is it pretty much the same as it was three or four years ago? I mean, I think... Three or four years ago, the revamp of good lagers, you know, that just keeps gaining, I feel like. So, right. and that's a good thing. That's what we love to drink. I mean, that's what I think most brewers will give you the same answer with that is they're happy that that's revitalized. Uh, but it does take up tank space and time. Yeah, that, that, that's something important to know that a lot of small breweries – that are on your corner downtown or something, they have very small tank space. They don't have a lot of tanks. And if you make a lager, it's going to tie up those tanks for many more weeks than does the ale. So they want to turn those tanks. So they don't tend to make as many lagers, or maybe they don't have time to let them fully develop as they you'd like. Yeah. Lower, uh, and then just lower alcohol beers in general mm -hmm. have come back and, that's a good thing for a number of reasons. Um, they're less expensive for us to make. We don't have to kick as many people, or, you know, <laughs> out of here. Uh, you know, it's it's a little bit, you know, it's yeah, yeah. Having beers that are easy easy to socialize with, and you know, um, so lower alcohol beers are are coming back strong. And I think that hazy IPAs are obviously still so popular, but Every once in a while, I'll throw a West Coast in there, and that's what we do. We don't always have a West Coast, but every once in a while, I'll throw one in there, and people appreciate it. When we brew our English-style mild, it doesn't sell fast, but it also uh, doesn't really go, even though it's lower alcohol, it doesn't really go bad fast either, mm -hmm. and there's a niche market that appreciates it. 
Yeah, you mentioned that you had the, that old West Coast IPA, which is the West Coast style, certainly, and the Tallahatchie IPA, that's you're still a West Coast style. Throw in a plug, though, for your East Coast or New England styles. What are a couple of those that you are proud of? Um, well, uh, by the by the time people hear this interview, uh, stop and smell the citrus. Uh, fresh batch of that should be hitting the Charleston and Huntington and uh, Morgantown areas. And, and stop and smell the citrus. Uh, that's uh, like a New England style IPA. It is. It's predominantly brewed uh, with citra hops. It's very hazy, juicy. Um, uh, it's kind of one of our, I think all breweries have a flagship citra hopped IPA and that's ours. Well, it's the, probably the most popular American hop, you know, for, for uh, IPAs. And then we also have another one, another one called Haggard, and uh, that's what Anthony brewed yesterday and today. We're trying to stay on top of those two and always have them rotating into the market. Those are kind of our two, I would say, most brewed hazy IPAs. Yeah, so you got a good book of IPAs here. They're all very well made, very popular. Certainly brings in people to your, you know, your brewery. But I, I'm going to encourage people. Well, once you're at this brewery or you're trying their beers, don't overlook these other styles that you may not be as familiar with. Certainly, like the Grisette or the Kolsch or the uh, Oktoberfest beers, because you'll find something that you love in in one of those kind of styles. And I, and that's just a few. You mentioned the English Mild. Again, another totally different style beer uh, that have different flavors. I just love that Weather Ground Brewery takes the time to experiment with these styles. And you've, your brewing talent that you've developed right here on site, Anthony Metter, your head brewer, Talk a little bit about Anthony and what he brings to this brewery. Well, he brings style for sure. I think because I'm a co-owner and moved here and started this with my wife, Erin, and father-in-law, uh, I, I feel like immediately got the attention of being a uh, head brewer. And I have my hand in all parts of this business, but Anthony makes the beer. He also creates recipes. He also tweaks recipes without my permission and uh sometimes sometimes i'm angry in the moment and then when the beer comes out it's the best beer i've ever tasted and well there's so, a reason you've hired him as your head guy here because takes, he's got talent i know a lot of other brewery owners that uh wouldn't trust somebody as much as i've trusted him and i'm super thankful that he's yeah. been here and the beer tastes the way it it does because of him well, this is a beer season, a good beer season, fall beers uh, coming up here at Weatherground Brewery. I mean, we mentioned certainly the Grisette, the Kolsch, the Oktoberfest, and the West Coast IPAs, and we mentioned some of the hazy IPAs, the English ales. You know, you just do so many styles, and, and certainly Anthony as well, uh, brewing those styles. I, I think that to build a business on that, I mean, it's not one-dimensional. You know, you're not just a Pilsner maker, and, and you do have a good Pilsner, too. Uh, we didn't even mention that one. Maybe I should here. What's that Pilsner that's, that you normally keep? 16 shots in Munich. Is that, 16 is our, shots in Munich. That's Pilsner. our that's our German-style Pilsner, yeah. but we've also got two or three other ones that we <laughs> rotate in and out now. They're just not packaged in the can form like 16 shots. Yeah, and even in a little lighter hop style, uh, just a basic lager, you're a... Uh, Cool Ridge Lager is a, a well-made beer. Cool Ridge is. Uh, you know, we joke about Cool Ridge uh, being our <laughs> Bud Heavy and cooler than Cool Ridge being our Bud Light. Uh, we now make a, a lighter version of Cool Ridge called Cooler Than Cool Ridge. And the big difference there is it's 4% instead of 5.5. And uh, But um, I think both of those beers are very good drinking uh, lagers. Um, again, all local malt, um, and just taking a lot of time and patience, uh, to, uh, to make those beers taste good. And I know you distribute your beers, uh, certainly in the Charleston, Huntington, Beckley areas, certainly Morgantown, but I know a lot of people won't have access to a lot of these beers and distribution. So you got to come down to Cool Ridge, West Virginia, 
uh, south of Beckley to, to find the, the really like, I don't know, what do you have, 20 beers on tap? I've, Usually somewhere between 15 and 20. We yeah. also serve cider, mead, wine, non-alcoholic beer, sodas. Uh, a lot of people think this is just a beer factory. We're a restaurant. We have brick oven pizzas, wings, salads, all that stuff. If you're not you know, on social media, we invite you to join our newsletter. We have a new newsletter out. Um, so you get that emailed to you every week telling you the new beers on tap as well as the new food specials and, and live entertainment. That's fantastic. Anyway, it's so nice to be out here in this beautiful scenery, mountain scenery in West Virginia, surrounded by fields and trees. You're out here on your own at this tap room. It's a beautiful place, incredible beers. Uh, thank you for uh, talking with us today, Sam. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure. Sam Fonda, co-owner of Weatherground Brewery with... Aaron Fonda, and his father-in-law, Tony, right? Yes. There you go. So to all you guys, it's been a great visit here. West Virginia Beer Roads at Weatherground Brewery today. West Virginia Beer Roads is a production of BrilliantStream.com.